Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 448 of the podcast and today I'm talking about happiness, anxiety and writing with Lisa Lilly and we also talk about how to juggle your writing career with a day job that you love because of course not everyone wants to be a full-time writer and you can have a wonderful writing career while enjoying the benefits of a day job. Actually, most authors do that. Most authors do not do this full time. <laughs> so I'm, I guess I'm an example. I am an author entrepreneur. Yes, I have over 30 books and I make a very good living just with my book sales. But you may have noticed I don't spend all my time writing. I'm more of a portfolio career type of person with podcasting, audiobook narration, um, the website stuff. And I'm increasingly creating for audio first and a bit like in the the well the podcast movement episode that I did last week that many of you found that very useful and that will not exist in any other form I'm not planning to put that in a book or or you know put it in an audiobook it will just exist as a blog post with a audio podcast episode with detailed notes and that was over 5000 words and I always write in fact I'm obviously I have notes now I'm reading this from my notes about the intro for the episode so I'm a writer. I make. Um, this is why my book is uh, the the book is um, how to make a living with your writing because I do make a living with my writing. It's just not all that writing is not books. These are important things to understand. Um, and I always say, you know, if you think you want what someone else is doing, if you think someone is a role model for you, then look at how they spend their time and what their lifestyles like and whether you want the whole package. <laughs> and I, I'm definitely a one or maybe two novels a year type of person. I do a lot of research, which I love. Research is a huge part of my process. We're off to uh, Portugal soon, off to Lisbon to research uh, Portuguese Jews back in uh, 1492 when all the, everyone was expelled, all the Jews were expelled from Spain and then Portugal. But we're going to research that and that will go into the next arcane book. But I love doing all that kind of thing, not just the writing. So the reason I'm mentioning this is there are no rules. You have to find what works for you and gives you the lifestyle you want as well as creative and financial fulfillment. And this is something I come back to all the time because, you know, some people say, oh, you spend all your time podcasting now. And I'm like, well, no, I don't actually. But I don't think, even if I did, I still think that is a valid way of both creation and income. And, uh, you know, this is an asset for me and it helps you. So this is great. <laughs> so I want to just point that out. You can be creative in so many ways now. It's very exciting. So anyway, lots of that coming up in the discussion with Lisa. Um, it's not just about anxiety. In fact, that's probably only about a quarter of what we talk about. Uh, we talk about a lot of other things. Um, so even if you don't suffer from anxiety or fear of failure or fear of judgment, um, then have a listen because we cover a lot more. In publishing news today, and this actually crosses over into the futurist segment, because uh, you may have heard the big publishers um, have joined together to sue Audible, Amazon and Audible, obviously, for the captions feature, which they say is a violation of copyright. So basically, uh, Audible is producing these things. They're mainly for education. So, you know, there's a kid in a class and uh, they, they can't read properly. So they're listening to an audio book, but they can also see text coming up on the screen. This is also good for language learners. This is also good. I was, I think I would like that too, because I read a lot of nonfiction books by audio. And sometimes I want to know what a word was, like if it's a nature book or a finance book where I'm not so familiar with the language, I want to know how to spell it. Uh, you know, I, I want to know that. 
So this is interesting because the publishers are obviously they're suing and saying this is a violation of copyright. You have licensed the audio rights to these books. You do not have the rights for the written text. But and this is where this gets even more interesting because I thought this was simple. I was like, yeah, that's totally true. And they shouldn't be allowed. Although I want that feature, what I'd like is some kind of new right um, which allows Audible to do the captions and everyone else to get paid for it. So that would be brilliant. But there's an article in The Verge, and I read The Verge a lot. It's more of a you know futurist type of blog. And it says, um, the feature uses machine learning to transcribe spoken words into written ones so users can read along while they listen to an audiobook. The issue, however, is Audible is doing this based on the recordings and they don't have the necessary licenses. But because Audible is relying on artificial intelligence, it appears the company is trying to claim a distinction between a newly created piece of text composed using AI based on an audio recording and the potentially near-identical text version of the book the audiobook was created from. And as evidence, they're saying the transcriptions may contain errors and they are not a recreation of the text of the book. So this is this is fascinating to me because this complicates things. As I have mentioned before on the um, nine ways publishing is going to be disrupted by AI, um, copyright is one of the areas because at the moment there really is no AI copyright law. It, I mean, the only thing is an AI cannot have a copyright. (laughs) So what this is now going to go into is a discussion on AI created text from audio and whether that is a new right. Now, I would still argue this is a new subsidiary right based on the original material. And of course, the author should get paid. But this is not the same as using the ebook as the text. So I I almost agree with both sides and that's why this is going to be difficult <laughs> and fascinating, I think. Um, so yeah, that is that. I also wanted to mention the Land of the Giants podcast. If you haven't checked that out, re- very interesting. Uh, it is uh, the first, this is about Amazon at the moment. They're on episode six as I record this. And this episode six is titled, Is Amazon Too Big? We Ask Its Sellers. Now, the the interviews, uh, well, it's a very well-produced podcast. It's not like my show, <laughs> which is me being all personal and whatever. This is highly produced, professional, recode podcast. Um, but basically, they interview lots of people. They have lots of quotes. Um, there is an investigative journalist. Now, they barely mention books. They mention it like twice, I think. But they do talk to some unhappy retailers in shoes, luggage and toy selling. And they talk about the three things that are making life very difficult um, selling on Amazon these days. So number one, ads. And we've talked about this before. Ads make it, basically, it's impossible to sell without using ads. And they noted that this eats into margins As Russell Blake said a few episodes ago, it is not 70% royalty. It's maybe 40%. It may even be less, depending on how much you're spending on ads. Two, counterfeiters and scammers, uh, which Amazon has not been able to police properly. And the, they give some very specific examples of counterfeiters. In fact, Birkenstock pulled their most of their business off Amazon because of the rise in counterfeits and how it was impacting their brand. And three, the rise of Amazon's own products competing with sellers on the platform. And these three things are exactly the same for authors. We need ads. There are scammers galore, especially in KU and Amazon publishing. So these are these three things are happening in all of these different niches. And the episode really asks, what can we do about it? And some, uh, so one is legislation and and they, you know, have the clip from Elizabeth Warren, um, the US senator who basically, you know, breaking up big tech kind of idea. Uh, also, they say the other choice is to build your own business away from Amazon, which is what Birkenstock are doing. And the third is that they say they have no choice. They have to sell there. There is no other choice. And uh, but they worry every day. So they're they are 
just so concerned that their business will disappear or they'll get hit with a scam or they hate being that dependent. And again, sounds like many authors I know. Um, so I wanted uh, to point that out to you. So that's Land of the Giants. Go check that out and uh, see what you think. And finally, uh, in voice first, if you thought that smart speakers and voice interaction was not mainstream yet. Well, it's definitely get that, getting there because the BBC here in the UK announced they will be launching an Alexa rival that will understand regional accents in the UK. And if you haven't been to the UK, we do have uh, some very, very different accents in different parts of uh, the country. And uh, But this won't be a physical speaker. It will be some kind of app or skill or whatever. Now, as I mentioned in the podcast movement episode, Brett Kinsella from voicebot.ai suggested we will end up with a plethora of voice assistants and they will they will be more like apps. So you might say, um, you know, BBC, find me a nature documentary on my TV. I might be talking to my TV. Whereas I might ask Google Assistant, um, you know, when the next train is from my local station. And I might ask Alexa to start playing the audiobook. I'm listening to. And maybe we'll have, a, like like we all have a certain number of apps on our phone that we use regularly, we will have our favourite voice assistants for our favourite things. So, super interesting segment there. So my personal update this week, I suddenly hit a flurry of publishing tasks. <laughs> so I have been editing productivity for authors, which is with my proofreader as this goes out. And this will be in ebook edition as part of an exclusive NaNoWriMo bundle, which I'll be telling you about uh, in a couple of weeks. And that will then go out for pre-order and will be available probably 1st of December 2019 for ebook print audiobook. So that's my what I've been writing this week. I had the first draft uh, dictated, um, which is good for a book on productivity because, of course, one of the chapters is dictation. So dictating the first draft is a good idea. So then what else? I... Um, Oh, yes. And I wanted to mention to say thank you to Chip, who emailed me to say your new initiative to voice your own audiobooks is a great decision. Your interpretation of your own words is already significantly better than your previous narrator's efforts. <laughs> now, I think my narrator, obviously, I QA'd all my other audiobooks. And I think my narrator has done really well. And the reviews are very good on the other audiobooks. But I love to hear from Chip saying this because, uh, I'm now very comfortable with the self-narration and definitely getting into more of that. Okay, what else? Yes, I also, so I had, and I've mentioned this, but I've narrated the second edition of Public Speaking for Authors, Creatives and Other Introverts. So that is now up for pre-order for the 1st of October 2019. The reason being, even though the ebooks are finished, the print books are finished, the paperback, large print, hardback, all done, I want to do a simultaneous release and a simultaneous promotion. And this will be a first. I've never done this before. So if I can pull this off, I'll be really happy. Uh, so basically, I've sub the, the audio has all been narrated, mastered and uploaded to Findaway Voices and ACX and I've submitted them. Now, normally they take around three weeks, but you can't tell. So I've given it just over a month. So hopefully by 1st of October, uh, that will be there. But if, you, if you're interested in the ebook, that is already up for pre-order on the various stores. Now, this is a new edition because when I went to narrate it, I realised a lot had changed since 2014. <laughs> so I updated more than 20% of the book. However, if you did buy the original version, and I will rely on your wonderful honesty and support of the show, I would be very happy to send you an arc of the new edition. So please email joanna at thecreativepen.com and just put um, arc or something in the um, arc of public speaking in the um, in the notes uh, in the header so that my assistant knows to send it on. So I've been doing that. Uh, what else have I been doing? Oh. Well, that's taken up a week. So it's interesting because when I, I got all the files for those print, um, the print files. So, of course, when you're doing paperback, large print and hardback. So I have to load it twice on KDP. So the um, so you, three times. So load the ebook, load the paper book, load the large print on KDP and then Ingram Spark load those three print versions. So you essentially have to and then my ebooks on all the other platforms. So by the time I finished, I've entered the same information 
a lot. And sometimes I think I should just put everything under one aggregator, but I don't like that. I like being in control. So I think I spent about four hours doing that um, the other day. But, you know, you just copy and paste stuff. But so I wanted to point that out because a lot of people say, oh, I couldn't possibly go wide. It just takes too long. Well, you know, that's four hours for all the ebook stores, um, all the well, all the major ebook stores and then um, the print copies and the audio. So really not that big a deal. Uh Yes. Yeah, so what am I doing next? I'm going to get back into my course on audiobooks, podcasting and voice technologies. And now I have a lot more to add given podcast movement. I'm also, um, I've got the two map books that I'm going to narrate before Christmas. And when I started to look at my time frame, because of course it's September, uh, October for me is mad. I'm going to be, well, in Frankfurt, I'm going to Frankfurt Book Fair. It is confirmed. I have my flights and I'll be in Las Vegas for the business masterclass. Um, so October is kind of out. So September, November, December, need to get all this done. And I can't believe it's 2020. I mean, it's crazy. I remember being 15 in 1990 and lying on my bed thinking about the millennium because I was going to be, I was, <laughs> at the time I was going to be 25 and I was in fact 25 in the year 2000. And I did, it was a big year. I resigned my job. I went uh, traveling to Australia and um, I didn't come back for 11 years. <laughs> Well, I did visit my family, but I didn't move back to the UK for 11 years. So it was the millennium was pretty huge for me. Um, and now here we are heading into the 2020s. And of course, I will be 45 in 2020. And um, surprisingly, it's it's turning into a bigger birthday than 40 ever was. Uh, I really want to go into, let's face it, the second half of my life um, in a in much better shape. Um, you know, sort out my business. So I'm doing a lot of personal examination as well at the moment. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Obviously lots this week as I did a double double show. Two big shows. Um, I've had lots of comments that both the shows were very useful. Eileen said of the Mike Shatskin uh, show, she feels like she'd been in a workshop that she paid to attend, although she didn't have to pay. <laughs> Mike is very knowledgeable and has the right voice to deliver the message. Lucky I never miss any episode of The Creative Pen. Thank you, Eileen. Oh, and thank you to Adam D. Rice, who sent me a lovely typed letter on an Underwood typewriter, uh, thanking me for the podcast. And it was always lovely to get letters in the post because usually they're from, uh, you know, they're just junk mail or whatever. <laughs> so that was nice. Um, Bernie Anderson said the podcast in between he said this week is a must listen. Um, Marion said, I had not heard of Mike Shatskin before. It was good to hear someone of his stature in the publishing industry have respect for indie authors and also loved his breakdown on Ingram Spark. That info has given me clarity on how as an indie author publisher to view them. Uh, and then lots more. But finally, I just also wanted to say thank you to Robin Sarti, who put on Twitter, books and travel warms my heart and makes me cry all while singing a siren song to my wanderer's soul. And I, I, I'm very, I'm thrilled about that. And it's funny because books and travel, I do differently to this show. And I don't read out tweets or anything. I mean, maybe one day I'll change that. But at the moment, I don't. So I thought I'd give a shout out to Robin. Yeah. <laughs> So, and if you're interested in, in my um, my travel show, come on over to booksandtravel.page. And in fact, I am going to do an episode on uh, Australia, that Australia thing, um, in a couple of weeks. And actually, I've got one coming up on Greenland. If you're interested in the news and um, what uh, President Trump has been talking about with Greenland, I will be putting out a podcast that will talk all about Greenland in next week. So today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark, and I'll play a word from the lovely Robin Cutler in a minute. And uh, as I said, I've spent some time this week on Ingram Spark loading my paperback large 
large print and hardback editions. And I just wanted to mention, of course, you don't have to do large print and hardback, but particularly large print is a market that's often missed and I found it to be well worth doing. And obviously with print on demand, once you have the upfront cost of uh, putting it up there, it's all profit. So I'm really happy with my large print stuff. And also hardback is probably just a vanity move, but they do look good on my shelf. (laughs) You also heard some of the words of praise last week for Ingram from Mike Shatskin, who knows the industry inside out. So um, Ingram, fantastic company, and I'm a very happy um, customer and user of the Ingram Spark uh, site. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing of the show. But my time is supported by my patrons. So thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. Thanks to new patrons, Alicia Ramirez, Holly Starkey, Felicity Green, Misty Moyer, Katrina Novak and Aurora Jacobson. I really appreciate your support on Patreon. Like the tweets and emails, it demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. And you can support the show for just a couple of dollars a month or a couple of coffees a month if you're feeling generous and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio of which there are... Oh, goodness, at least 30 episodes of. So you have lots more audio if you support the show for just a couple of dollars. You can support the show, if you don't know, at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a little word from Ingram Spark, and then we'll get into the interview. Are you ready to take that bold step forward and finally publish your book? Well, now's the time to do it. Hi, everyone. I'm Robin Cutler, director of Ingram Spark, an award-winning indie publishing platform that offers authors like you a way to publish your book and share it with over 39,000 bookstores and libraries worldwide. Knowledge is power, and we believe authors should be knowledgeable. That's why we offer education through our weekly blog and podcast featuring industry experts and even online courses on how to self-publish and market your books. Let us take care of the details so you can focus on what you do best, which is writing. You have a story to tell, and we want to help you share it. Get started today at www.ingramspark.com. Lisa M. Lilly is the best-selling author of suspense, thrillers, and supernatural novels, as well as non-fiction for writers. She's also an attorney and adjunct professor of law. Her latest book is Anxiety, Happiness, and Writing, Using Your Creativity to Live a Calmer, Happier Life. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, Joanna. It's so great to be talking with you. Oh, yeah. Great to have you on the show. So tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing, especially as a second career. So I started, I'm one of those people who started when I was a kid. So I was about seven and I had this older cousin we visited maybe to every couple of years. And she happened to be keeping a notebook where she wrote poems. And I thought that was so neat. So I got my own notebook when I got home and started writing. And I think it was the optimal age to write because I wasn't worried about if it was good or would anyone like it. And after that, I just, I kept writing. I liked reading books. So I wrote novels and it wasn't until college that I actually thought about doing it as a career. So I got my degree in writing in English and figured, oh, I'll just write my first novel, sell it, and I'll never have to work again. <laughs> yeah. and, oh, that's yeah. old chestnut. <laughs> yeah. So I wrote the first novel and the second novel and the third novel. And at some point I got kind of tired of doing day jobs where you know, I, I had no real responsibility and I went to law school and that was the start of feeding writing in around another career where I had all these responsibilities. And I found that it was it was very different than when I kind of the equivalent of punched a clock and went home at five. So my my thoughts about writing as a second career were like, how do you juggle two things that you love so much and that you see as careers, not just a job or a hobby, but, you know, multiple careers? 
Yeah, and it's it's really interesting because, uh, and it's fantastic that you love your your law career as well, because so many, I meet, you know, a lot of people who are, are trying to escape their other career. So I wonder, like, what are some of the positive aspects of having a job that pays, you know, regular, <laughs> a regular <laughs> wage and presumably quite a good wage? Um, you know, does that, how does that help your writing, having that stability? Yeah, I, I was kind of, surprised by how much it did because initially I resisted the idea of having another career and it was my boss. I was a paralegal and I would help get ready for trials and help write uh, appellate briefs and do research, but I couldn't try the case and I couldn't argue the appeal. And I had so many questions and he said to me, you know, why, why don't you go to law school and become a lawyer? And I said, no, I want to be a published author. And he said, well, some people think you could do both like John Grisham and Scott Turow. And I thought, oh, well, okay. And I, I, it took a while to come to terms with it, but it turned out in so many ways, um, you know, not the financial side was nice. Not, it was the first time in my life. I didn't worry about money from when I was a kid. You know, we were always kind of struggling and I always had to think about could I afford things and where, you know, how much was I spending? But more than that was just a broader range of experience. You know, I get to, I met so many different clients. I learned about their businesses. I met people in all different walks of life. I developed a professional network and all those things work their way into my writing in one way or another. And I really feel like make it richer and give me greater perspectives to write from. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so glad to talk to you about this. I we're going to get into the anxiety thing in a minute, but this is such a great perspective because I feel like the the kind of overwhelming vibe in the author community is, oh, you must make a full time living as a, as a writer, and of course I do, but I have multiple streams of income, so it's not all on you know a book sale, for for example. But uh, Elizabeth Gilbert in her um, book Big Magic talks about this about how you can't or you shouldn't rely on your art to feed you, you should feed your art. And that's basically more what, what you, you're doing. So do, do you, when you, because you're very much involved in commu writers, communities and things, uh, do, you know, do you think this is a healthier balance, having something that earns money and then the writing? I think it really depends on, you know, on, on the person and where you are in life. For me, I, for a long time, thought oh, what I want to do, I just want to be able to sit in a room and write all day and just write and only do that and, and tend to my author business. And for about six months, I did that. And I ended up uh, kind of depressed and very anxious because for me, it was too much time in my own head. And it was a lot of pressure on, you know, how am I going to make this pay? And you know, I make uh, some money writing, but not, it would not be enough to support me by itself. But I also realized I'm just happier when I do multiple different things. So it, it took a while to realize that I was unhappy when almost all my hours were practicing law and I had little time for anything else. And then I wasn't really happy when it was almost all writing. So I have a nice mix right now. And I think everyone has to figure out what that is for themselves. Yes. And of course, the old uh, adage, know yourself is so important. I mean, I'm similar in a way in that I can't just write all the time. Like I like doing other things like podcasting, for example. Um, so yeah, I understand that. So let's get into the book because you mentioned anxiety there. So anxiety, um, obviously, and depression are very common in the general population, <laughs> let alone writers, of which I don't know whether it's more common in writers because we're in our heads, you know, a lot, as you say, but um, it's certainly a big, a big deal in the community. So let's talk about anxiety. How has anxiety played a part in your life and what are some of the common anxieties amongst writers? For me, the, I started having severe anxiety in my mid-20s and it surrounded work because I developed a repetitive stress injury. And at the time I was making my living by word processing and secretarial work. And then I wrote on the side and I also played guitar. 
And I was getting my hands going numb and hurting and shooting pains. And at the time, people weren't all that familiar with repetitive stress injuries from keyboarding. And there weren't very good medical options. Um, It was basically surgery and then go back to the same job and then have surgery again. And that seemed like a bad idea. So I, I stopped working for a while and I you know, I became extremely anxious because I didn't know what I was going to do for a living. Everything I had done had partly at least depended on my keyboarding skills. And I couldn't write because it really hurt me. I couldn't play guitar. And it just felt like everything was gone in my life. And I, in a way, lost my home. I moved back with my parents and I used to lie awake at night and just think and think and think like, and they were very disempowering thoughts. You know, what if I never get better? What if I never support myself again? What if my hands always feel this way? What if I totally lose feeling in them? And I got through that time and I, you know, I retrained. That's when I became a paralegal. But um, for about a year, this anxiety was really intense. And when I started working again, I remember feeling so anxious. I felt like I couldn't breathe and I would go into the ladies room and lock myself in a stall and just breathe, just take deep breaths. Uh, The good thing is everything I learned during that time, I then carried forward. And, you know, when anxiety would come back, I started developing better ways to deal with it, uh, which is part of what's in the book or most of what's in the book. As far as writers go, I, I feel like there are some anxieties that are specific or really common to writers. And one is just how personal our work is. So we work so hard on something, especially if you're a novelist. I think my first novel I published, I spent like five years on it and you're putting it out there and it's so much of who you are in your characters and your plot. And you're putting it out there for people to judge and they will judge it and criticize it and they will criticize it. Somebody will. You could get you know, 20 bad reviews. And the one that you're going to focus on is that one bad one. So there's that real fear of putting ourselves out there and being rejected or feeling like a a failure. And I think that I know a lot of writers who are very talented, who can't even finish anything because underneath it is that fear. If they finish it, then they'll have to put it out there and maybe find out that someone doesn't like it. Yeah. uh, And actually that's true. I mean, someone right. won't like it. <laughs> someone won't like it. It's almost guaranteed. And so, yeah, and I, I think you have to you have to find ways to deal with that. And I do think it gets better. Like the, the more, I, and I'm sure I've heard you say similar things, the more books you put out, the less you feel that each one is you, you know, and the more it's, okay, there's this book and the next book and the next book, and it doesn't feel quite as personal anymore. Yeah, in fact, I, I normally say, you know, that uh, your book is your baby metaphor. And I always kind of say, well, you know, that might work for the first three, maybe four, but it doesn't work when you get to 27. <laughs> right. That's too many babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not babies anymore. They are employees doing their work. Um, yes. But no, I totally get that. So, so I'm interested then because you're, so why this book now? Because I feel like you, your anxieties um, have, I guess a lot of them were from earlier in your life. What did you see in the community that made you want to do this book now? Yeah, I, so one thing about, I feel like having had that severe anxiety as I went on in life, smaller things would happen that would throw me off. And it was almost like a rubber band snapping me back into those anxious thoughts, even though I wasn't facing as difficult a situation. So each time I think I got a little better at dealing with it. And now I'm, yeah, I'm probably at one of the best places I've been in terms of feeling pretty, pretty calm most of the time. But last year I broke my foot and I ended up in a cast from my toes up to my knee for about eight weeks and then still had to stay off of it for some time. And it was a weird experience because I knew that that was a short-term issue. I knew I would get better. And yet it, it really triggered some of that anxiety. Plus it, it kind of forced me to be inside more and I couldn't interact as much with people. So again, I had that I'm in my head all the time 
And I found myself really slipping into these patterns of worry and and anxiety. And it also was, it was hard to sleep. And when I don't sleep, that triggers more anxiety. So I, I really had to draw on all the things that I had learned over the years, some of which I had kind of forgotten about because things have been going pretty good. So I decided to do something positive out of it, which was to sit down and kind of write this book that was partly to work through what I needed and put what I had learned together and to share it with other people. And the reason I focused on writers was over the the last few years of meeting more writers at conferences and connecting online, I was surprised how many people when I would kind of say, oh, you know, I have a little bit of problem with anxiety. And I felt almost embarrassed about it or like you're supposed to seem like you're together all the time. And I was shocked how many people who I had perceived as, oh, always being so calm and focused and centered and upbeat say, yes, I have that too. I have that same thing. And I do that same thing of what if this terrible thing happens and what if the next terrible thing happens? So it it seemed to me I was running into a lot of creative people who struggled with that. Mm, I I would say that Definitely. I don't know anyone who doesn't suffer from some kind of of um, worry, but I know obviously anxiety and depression, there's a, there's a scale of these things, obviously, um, where it can get uh, super bad for people. But let's talk about some of the ways um, in which, as you say in the book, you can use writing and your creativity to help yourself your, through those times. Uh, so, so give us a, a couple of ideas there. Yeah, one of one of the things I think for writers that we do that's great for our writing is that that what if scenario, because we want to give our protagonists challenges, there needs to be conflict. So we say, what if, you know, what if this thing happened to the protagonist, and then we do an escalating series of conflicts where it gets harder and harder. And then we turn around and do that with our own lives. And that creates anxiety. So one of the things I found most helpful is to take that mental effort and energy. My brain's going to spin around anyway and direct it in a different way by changing the questions I ask myself. And I got this mainly from Anthony Robbins, one of his books. And instead of saying, well, what if this awful thing happens and the next terrible thing after that, I might say, okay, what if that happens? And my next question is, how could I be better prepared for that? So for instance, if I'm worried about getting laid off, because a lot of my anxieties would focus around jobs, I would say, okay, what could I do right now that would make me more valuable to my company, maybe, so I'm less likely to get laid off? Um, and that might lead me to say, oh, I could, uh, I could, um, you know, develop a better relationship with my boss. Maybe I could take a class that would help me have more skills. Or, you know, if I did get laid off, what could I do that would make me um, someone people want to hire? So maybe I update my resume. Maybe I go to some networking events. And it's basically putting your brain to work in a good way. Instead of all that mental energy on fears, it's on solutions. And I often find that leads to great things. Maybe that leads me to find a better position. Um, The other thing is really using our skills at creating vivid scenes. And something I found very helpful is in the morning, I will write down five things I'm grateful for. And at least one of them, I won't just write down, I'm grateful for it. I will write why and the scene. So in the book, I give the example of if, you know, my cousin came to visit and I'm grateful I got to see her. So instead of writing that, I would really write out the scene and say, oh, we had such a great time. That pasta we made with the fresh garlic tasted wonderful. Um, The present she brought me, the candle with the chocolate scent smelled so good. And we sat by the fire and we shared stories about our parents. And it made me feel closer to my mom and dad who are gone. And by doing that, you're not just feeling grateful, you're actually re-experiencing good things in your life. And it's a nice counter to so often we re-experience the bad things. We relive the mistake that we made or the thing that upset us. And this helps get in the habit of reliving the great things too. And Mm. the reason I say add a few more is it makes us start looking for 
a number of things. So just as we scan for things to worry about, we start scanning our day for things that we're really happy about. Oh, there's so much there. <laughs> and I'm really pleased you shared some of that. Um, I have to I'll have to share some of mine. So I I think that gratitude thing is amazing. And I also I don't do it, I don't write it down every day, but if I'm if I feel negativity coming on, um, and I, you know, I seem very positive to everyone because that's the side I share, but obviously I have down days too. But when I sit down to write a, a big list of gratitude, I often do start with really simple things like where we, where we live now. Um, if I open the window, I will always hear a blackbird singing. Like there's just this. Oh, these, nice. Yeah. And so there's always bird song and there's just a little patch of wild stuff just around the corner. And I, and I walk there almost every day and I hear the blackbird singing and it's like, well, okay, so this happened and this happened, but the blackbird's still singing. <laughs> so, yes. And bird song is really, I mean, I know you can listen to it on headphones and stuff, but nothing beats going and listening to some birds. So there's, you know, it's a really basic tip, right? Just go be in some nature and you will feel better. <laughs> I love nature for that. I live in a in Chicago in very close to downtown and I love being in a big city and I I don't foresee moving away but I find it very relaxing to even just go to a large park where I can't see traffic and I can't really hear it and like you said you hear birds or I just smell the grass and the trees. Yeah, and that just it just helps you and you get some perspective like I uh, I also walk along the canal a lot here and I just get a lot of oh okay this is real life. Get off the internet and social mm-hmm. media and look the river and the canal and the water and the heron fishing and hey everything's all right. Uh, you know, I'm breathing, the world's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I have a thing where in my head, if I start you just kind of feeling blue or down and I'll think, Lisa, get out of the condo, <laughs> just leave the house and, and go somewhere. And the lake here is maybe a mile and a half from me, Lake Michigan. So that's always a nice place for me to go. And same thing, look out at the water, look at the seagulls. Yeah. And just see that there is a whole world out there. Yeah. Doing, doing other things, uh, and, and living lives. So that's one thing. And then I wanted to come back on the what if thing. I, as you were talking, I realized that I do that. That's why I almost have the futurist segment on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I think my obsession with at the moment, the way AI is changing things about voice tech is because I'm thinking, what if my business model shifts. Well, it will. It has to. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've all found this. Uh, You've been doing this uh, a number of years as well. The business model, even in the last 18 months, has changed. So we have to say, well, what if? And I'm like, well, what if my website traffic halves? You know, does that mean my income halves? And what can I do about that? So the what if scenarios are actually driving my actions to the future. And then I was talking, my mum is, my mum's in her seventies, you know, she's very worried about um, climate change and war and, you know, all the things. Uh, we can all worry about those things, but I was like, all right, mum, well, what are you going to do about it? Because you can't stop. So she's writing um, like a prepper book, like an urban survival oh, prepper wow, book great. for older people and not just older people, like any of us, like I'm, I don't have a, I have a clue. You probably don't either. Like we live in a city, right? <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, well, and she, making her feel so much better to write a book about prepping for urban survival, even though that, you know, fingers crossed is not going to happen. Um, it's still making her feel better. So those are all great ways of of helping, aren't they? Yes. And, and I think you make a really good point, like asking that what if is it can be a very positive thing, even about your own life. Like to say, what if, if it prompts you to think about, oh, here are options and kind of look around life's corners a little, as long as it doesn't make you um, just obsess about the bad things. So you look ahead and say, oh, well, what would I do? And I love your mom writing the prepper book because she's gathering information. She's thinking about what she could do and presumably having a lot of fun writing the book. That yeah. other people will also, you know, find uh, 
enjoyable and learn something from. Yeah, exactly. And I did say to her mom, it's a really great niche. So <laughs> yeah, that also, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it should be pretty good for income as well. But um, I want to come back on um, the physical health issue. I mean, you've mentioned RSI, you mentioned um, your leg last year. And I remember seeing the pictures on Twitter uh, that you posted sometimes um, of your leg. Um, and physical health for many people, whether it's chronic health conditions, whether, you know, I still get a twinge of R- R- RSI sometimes, um, just a twinge because I do yoga like a lot to try and maintain the phys- my physicalness now. Um, but what are, what are some of the ways that people can still write? Because, you know, often that, in- that injury could either stop them completely or, you know, what, what are some of your tips? Yeah, there were a number of years when I really had to do a lot of what I think of as like workarounds or or accommodations like you might do in a in a job. So some of the things I've done um even before there was dictation software, I would tape on a cassette tape my first draft basically of a story or a journal entry and I used to take it to my writers group And we usually read anyway, we would read our stories. So instead I would play them the tape and they would comment. And then when I actually sat down to write it at my keyboard, I would be doing the equivalent of a second draft. So that would save me about half of the typing. I also did a lot more in my head. So instead of in, before I had the RSI, I would sit down for a few hours at a time and just type. And if I was thinking through a character, I would just type it out. It was almost, I was a very fast typist. So it was like, I would think and it would appear on the screen. And that was how I liked to do it. Well, I I couldn't do that anymore. So instead I might just sit down and think about my character and imagine interviewing my character in my head or imagine situations in my mind and maybe take a couple brief notes about it, but not actually write it all down. And then I would do this thing. I would call it like, it was sort of like a walk and talk on TV, but it was just me. I might be out in the park, just walking back and forth and talking through my story. And I'm sure people thought I was very odd. (laughs) Um, Now I could do it because I could just put a earbud in and they'd think I was on the phone. But, um, so, you know, things like that, things like writing in shorter bursts, which, really helped me later as a lawyer when a lot of my writing was done 15 minutes at a time here and there. So I might sit down and, you know, hand write for 15 minutes and then walk away from it and come back later and work on that. I also found just figuring out small things that help. Like you mentioned yoga. I found some stretches that helped. I did things like when I was making maybe $11 an hour. I actually paid someone $15 an hour to clean my little apartment because scrubbing was very hard on my hands. Mm. So I tried to figure out what are all the things that I could change so I could sort of save that time that I could use my hands for my writing. And over time that, you know, that really helped a lot. All those small things. I kept looking for a big thing that would fix everything. And instead it was a combination of smaller things. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I mean, I've obviously over the years talked about dictation a lot, but I think it's so important for writers before they are in pain. So if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I, I'll just never need that because I'll never be in pain. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I always thought. <laughs> it will sneak up on you. I mean, if you're listening to this and you're in your 30s, well, you know, think about when you're 45. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really is, um, you know, that's life, isn't it? That's physical health. Things happen and you have to maintain things. And that's why uh, you and I wrote The Healthy Writer. You know, there are just all these things that you learn over time. But also like, dictations become so much easier and so much cheaper. Um, I'm using now a service for this show called Trint dot com, T-R-I-N-T dot com, which is AI transcription. And it takes about you know, 45 seconds to transcribe this whole interview. <laughs> That's amazing. I know. It's just, just brilliant. I mean, you have to do a light edit, but you have to do a light edit if you dictate, you know, yourself and whether you use a human transcriber and it's a lot cheaper. So that's the type of thing you can use. I'm also glad you mentioned a cleaner because I've had a cleaner for, yeah, probably 15 years at this point <laughs> in all the different places I've lived because I, well, I, I don't, 
particularly enjoy it um, and I'd rather pay for someone else um, so that I can use that time to do other things. But you're right also about the physical, the physicality of it. If you're right handed and my RSI has been in both arms at different points. But yeah, I mean, you have to look after yourself and spending money on something that frees you up physically and also mentally gives you more time is is great. And obviously, if people listening love cleaning, then awesome, go for it. (laughs) Right, right. If it's something you enjoy, but if it's something you don't, and yeah, it frees time and it helps you physically. It's worth it if you can do it. Yeah, definitely. So you also have a chapter on affirmations and it was really, I was thrilled to see my own affirmation in the book, um, which uh, was just lovely. So my affirmation, as you know, but for the listeners, uh, I am creative. I am an author is what I said to myself for about 18 months before I even put pen to paper. <laughs> So, um, you know, how how do affirmations work? These kind of positive statements. I am creative. I am an author before I even was like, how does that help? Yeah, I I think there's a few ways. And, And the first is to create the affirmation. You have to figure out what it is you want. So you had to come to the conclusion that that was something you wanted in your life. You wanted to be creative and be an author. So it makes us sit down and and really think about where we want to be. And I feel like there are uh, a lot of people get stuck because they don't do that. And they're do, I meet a lot of lawyers that way who will just say, well, it's, you know, they don't like practicing anymore, but they can't really envision anything else, even changing to a different law job. They can't, picture that. So you, you need to say, Hey, this is what I want. And by saying it, I think it, it gives our brain the single signal to start moving in that direction. So once you say I'm creative, I am an author, your brain starts saying, okay, well, what does a creative person do? Like, how does a creative person go about life? And your brain starts doing the things you need to do to get you to where you want to be. And then it also gives us motivation. I think it helps us feel and experience that excitement about being, being an author or whatever it is you're affirming or envisioning. And that keeps us going during the tough times. Like I'll do affirmations. I also will do visualizations. I used to, when I was writing and I was having trouble moving forward, I would picture having the finished book in my hands, like a manuscript um, printed off the printer with all the pages or actually holding a book with a book cover. And that helped give me a push to keep going, even though it was taking a long time. And I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't, there were moments when I didn't have the confidence. So I think the affirmations can give you that. Yeah, I think you're right about the focus. I hadn't really thought about it like that, but but yeah, and if you say the same thing over and over again and then uh in your head and then I couldn't even say it out loud at the beginning and then, you know, eventually amusingly it was probably 2 years after that when I came up with the name The Creative Pen for my website, which was my third website. I never would have associated the word creative with myself. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And of course, now people are like, oh, yeah, of course, that's what your website is. And I'm like, well, I never thought about it that way. You know, I didn't even my name, pen, I didn't even associate that with a pen, an actual pen. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? The things we don't believe about ourselves, but you can change. And I'm a Tony Robbins fan as well. Um, his his books have, have certainly made an impact on, on me. I do want to come back on the affirmations because you actually said earlier on, that you had this dream of being a published author. Um, so how how and when did you decide to go indie? And how has that related to your to your dreams and your goals? Yeah, I so I had like I mentioned, written a number of books and and kind of, I call it climbing the rejection ladder. I was getting more personal rejections and I was getting feedback and invitations to, you know, submit your next book. And I had written my, the novel that I ended up self-publishing, The Awakening, and finished it around when I started my own law firm. And I had taken it to a conference and a publisher actually asked to see the whole thing and he read it and he gave me some really good comments about it, particularly the pacing. 
And I looked and I thought, well, I think it's good the way it is. But I was immersed in starting my firm. And and so I spent most of the first year in my practice focusing on that. And when I came back to the book, to I was thinking to send it out again to agents and publishers, maybe even back to that editor, because when I read his comments, I now thought, oh, I see what he's saying. And I think I know how to address this. Right around then, I happened to read a Wall Street Journal article about John Locke and how he was publishing his books. Is it John? Yeah, yeah John Locke. John Locke. I think. Yeah, one of yes. the early millionaire or well, indies, yes. 99 cent millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, I didn't think, oh, I'll, I'll make a million dollars right away. But I did think, huh, well, he made the point of, you know, he had started, I think, his own insurance agency and no one said, well, that's, you know, that's self that self-insurance agency, that's because you couldn't make it in the real world. Um, he's like, why shouldn't I start my own publishing company? And I thought, you know, I started my own law firm and that's going really well. Why do I want to, I did that so I could have more control over the business and what I wanted to do. And I thought, why am I not doing that for my writing? So instead of sending it out to Uh, agents again and querying, knowing I would have to probably wait six months to get a response, I thought, I'll publish this myself. And I also got advice from a a writing teacher. I had a really good thriller author, Gary Braver. And I said, what do you think? And he said, well, if you like running your own business, you will probably like self-publishing. And I thought, I do like running my own business. So that's why I decided to do it that way. And I've, I've really never looked back. And I love that answer because that is the the right reason. It's the control and empowerment and, and an active decision to do that yourself. You know, I much prefer that kind of choice than, oh, I just couldn't get a deal, you know. <laughs> Which right. I, always, I always find slightly annoying. I'm like, but, but this is a great choice. You know, this should be an active choice. <laughs> yeah, it's not like the consolation prize. <laughs> no, exactly. And running your own business is like very respected. So exactly. So that's brilliant. So let's come back on your law um, career because you've actually got a blog. I'm like, how? Uh, when I had a look, I was like, how on earth do you manage this as well? So you've got writing as a second career dot com, and as well as all your books and your fiction and your nonfiction and your your law, your you've got this other website. Um. So how how are you managing? both parts of the life that you love without burning out and getting RSI again? Yeah, it's, I feel like for me, the key was um, realizing that that balance, whether it's work life, or I used to joke work, work, work balance for all the kinds of work I do. It really changed a lot over time. So I feel like I'm, I finally gotten better at it, or maybe you've just caught me at a really good time. But um, I, you know, there were times in my life when law, when I first became a lawyer, that most of my work was in law and other things were secondary. And then that would shift around a little. And then when I started my own firm again, most of my hours were at law. And there was a point where I started to burn out and it, it took me probably too long to realize it. So I I figured out the key was to recognize when I started to feel overloaded and really think about making a change. So there was about two years when I started and continued to feel kind of angry. I'd feel angry as if I had no control over my life, even though I was running the law practice, I was doing my publishing, but I I felt like I don't know, I I felt like I I couldn't control anything, like it was a runaway train. And I finally realized that was not just temporary because my answer to that was always, oh, I'll just work harder. I'll put my head down and power through. And I realized I'm like, I I can't, this is not a way to live. So I made, that's when I made a change. And I took me about three years to gradually shut down my law practice. I don't have my own law firm anymore. So the bulk of my time is writing. And then I do try to teach one class a semester. And for law, I do project work for another law firm that I used to share cases with. And it's great because I just have pieces of things. Maybe, you know, I find the experts for one case or I'm working on a certain issue and writing, making arguments on just that issue. 
And if there's an emergency, I am not the person who has to rearrange my vacation Mm. to deal with it. And when I was a newer lawyer, I wanted the responsibility. You know, I couldn't wait to run the case and be the one who talked to the clients and do all of that. And there was a time when that was really fun and I didn't mind putting, you know, kind of squeezing my writing around the edges of that. Um, But now it's nice that I've sort of been able to flip that. So law kind of fits in around my writing at this point. And probably that's how it'll stay. But maybe sometime down the road, I'll flip that around again. Well, that's really great. And again, it's about changing over time because that the John Locke thing probably would have been 2010. Yeah, I think, I, yes, about 2010, 2011. Yeah. That's when I published my first book. Yeah, ra- around then. Yeah. And I, I connected with with John back in the early days. I'm pretty sure he's still around, but a bit like Joe Comrath, uh, you know, sort of, and Hugh Howie and pe- people around at the beginning have kind of uh, gone gone a lot quieter. <laughs> yes. I mean, there's a lot more voices in the indie space now, but it's interesting because, you know, you've adjusted your your work, work, work balance. I'm, I'm the same. We're so similar in that way. I love work. I mean, I, I work a lot (laughs) and I love it. And, but like you say, doing the different things means that there is some balance with the different aspects of work. Um, and yeah, I mean, you may well change the balance again as, as I'm doing too. So then I, just the last question, because I'm really interested, because again, you've been doing this a while now and I find that, um, you know, being learning junkies like we are and changing things up, but as more sort of advanced, uh, in the, in the space now, we've got a lot of books, we know, know what we're doing. I mean, really. So uh, what, what things are you finding interesting? Um, what are you learning about right now? So I just started reading um, an advanced copy of Jim Cukrell's book, Unskippable. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Jim's coming on the show. Or he might oh, have been on the show by the time this goes out. <laughs> yes. That, yeah, and I, that's great because I, I'm not all the way through, but he makes a couple really points that really resonated with me. And the first one was about, it's not just about your business and making money. It's about your whole life and what you want out of it. And for me, that's been partly recognizing that after so many years of working so many hours, I want to set aside more time for leisure and fun and that it's okay if I'm not going to put out a book a month, which is just probably never going to happen, that I might do a slower pace. But the other is he's talking about how, you know, it's not you can advertise and I've been playing with Amazon ads and so forth, but that only gets you so far. And what you really need is to connect with people and to have them trust you and think about how you, how you would do that. And for me, it's, I've been thinking more about audio because I think that is, um, I mean, and this is no surprise because you talk about it a lot, but it is really a way to connect. So I've been, looking at do would I want to record my own nonfiction books? I don't think I'd ever do novels, but the nonfiction so that it's actually my voice. And I have actually downloaded the um, Audacity software that you recommended for mm. podcasting. So I've been thinking about that as well. I have an idea for the last year that I've been planning and considering, and I feel like anything like that, that is a more personal, specific to you and who you are, and that no one else can do the way you do is probably key going forward. And because almost everyone I know, people I never would have imagined listening to audiobooks or podcasts are telling me that that's, that's what they do on their commutes, or that's what they do where they're cleaning their house. And it's what I do when I'm doing laundry. I'm, I'm thinking about going that in that direction. Mm. Well, I think that's great. And in fact, this book that we've been talking about, um, Anxiety, Happiness and Writing, it's got quite a lot of memoir things in it that are personal to you and, and your life. And I think, you know, it would be great if you read it. And um, because you're used to uh, teaching and speaking, you know, in your in your law practice and um, you you have pacing, like I can hear your pacing as you speak and naturally you seem to have good pacing. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And so, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I want to encourage everyone who wants to, to get into audio. I mean, cause I think there is a connection. I mean, 
well, you know, you've listened to my show for a long time and we've connected in person and, and everything, but it, it makes a huge difference to hear someone's voice and you just learn so much more about them, I think. Yeah, there's there's definitely, um, it, it adds to that trust factor. And I was thinking it was, as I was reading Jim's book, it was fortuitous that you and I were talking today because going back to writing conferences, the Smarter Artists Summit in Austin, I went there completely because you talked about it on your show and said you were going to be there. I had never heard the guy's podcast. I had never heard of the Smarter Artists Summit. But because I had listened to your show and learned so much over a, a few years, and I even had read your blog earlier when you weren't podcasting yet, I thought, well, if Joanna Penn is going to speak there. This must be a good conference. And I want to go. It was my first indie author conference. And that was why I went. And it was a great experience. So I, I feel like you really proved Jim's uh, Jim's whole premise there. So you can tell him that for me. <laughs> oh, I will. But that's really funny. I actually have read your blog post about that. And I remember, and, and you're like, yeah, I didn't know who these guys were. And then I was listening to their podcast and then I was slightly worried about that. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> which I really was. was. <laughs> which was really funny. Um, but of course, um, that's the guys from what what is now the Story Studio podcast. And that conference is no more. So that's another interesting thing. I mean, I mean, these cycles of who you learn from and what you're learning, you know, I just wanted to point that out to people too, that that changes over time. And, you know, so always be learning, always be changing. So we are out of time, but where can people find you and your books online? Uh, you can find my fiction and nonfiction both at Lisa Lilly, L-I-L-L-Y dot com. Uh, also on Twitter and uh, Twitter and Instagram, it's at Lisa M. Lilly. And then my book, uh, my blog on writing is writingasasecondcareer.com. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Lisa. That was great. Thank you so much, Joanna. So I hope you found the interview with Lisa useful today. And in fact, one of her comments stuck with me. I kept looking for a big thing that would fix everything and instead it was a combination of smaller things. And this is so true in every area of our lives because massive change is difficult, but these smaller changes pay off. So you don't have to think, oh, I need to write that whole novel all at once or I I, I just... I don't make any money from my books right now and I want to make six figures. These things are too big. You, do, you just can't do that. Don't bite off more than you can chew. So just start by writing 500 words or making $10 or whatever is the first step and you can grow from there. Also, one update, uh, things move fast around here. Uh, and I mentioned this last week, but I was using trint.com uh, for my transcripts, but now I'm using descript.com as they also do audio edits, which I'm using for the podcast. So um, others have also recommended otter.ai. So check them out too. So if you need transcription, there are a lot of options these days. And I, I predict the price of transcription will come down to zero. Uh, with AI um, because they'll sell you other things. Um, transcription will just be a normal thing. Uh, in next week's show, I'm talking to audiobook coach supremo Sean Pratt about audiobook narration and also performance tips. If you're on a podcast or you're speaking at an event, which eventually you're going to have to do if you want to be a successful author. I know many of you don't want to, but this is what you will have to do eventually. So you might as well get used to it. <laughs> and in a voice first world, it's definitely time to focus on that. Um, so happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>